slick, subtle, elegant. He was a five-time NHL All-Star, five-time Team MVP, and a Lester Pearson Award recipient. He was a player who dazzled and overwhelmed the opposition with his exquisite stick handling. A player whose wrist shot was so feared, so lethal, goalies had no choice but to surrender to its dominance. A silent leader who led by his actions night in, night out. Standing at 6 feet, 191 pounds, he's Nazzy, oh captain my captain, number 19, Marcus Naslund. Naslund dashing in, 10 seconds left, Marcus Naslund to the net, stop, scores! 5.7 seconds left, and they're still alive! Marcus Sten Naslund was born on July 30th, 1973 in Ornjevik, Sweden. Growing up in the town of 30,000, he would play hockey at the local outdoor rink. Naslin had become friends with a kid named Peter Forsberg, and even though they played on different youth teams, they would later become teammates as they joined the regional all-star team at the age of 14. They would go on to win the U16 championship a year later, as Naslin would be recognized as the tournament's best forward. Naslin and Forsberg attended high school together, and they would join the Moto hockey system at the age of 16, as well as the Swedish junior team. At the age of 17, Naslin would break a rookie record in the Swedish Elite League with 10 goals and 9 assists. But it was during that spring in 1991 during the European Junior Championship tournament, in which he registered 14 goals and 2 assists in only 6 games, when he got the attention of NHL scouts. And due to his production and promise, Naslin would be selected in the 1991 NHL Entry Draft, 16th overall by the Pittsburgh Penguins. Naslin would spend a couple more years with Moto in which he developed into a top prospect, drawing comparisons to future teammate Jeremir Jager, and the left winger from Sweden who was looking to arrive in Pittsburgh for the start of the 93-94 season was expected to produce right out of the gate. But produce he did not, and he would register a meager 11 points in 71 games in his rookie year. The Penguins at the time were not short on offensive firepower, with a myriad of hockey legends in their top six. And a skilled player like Naslund, if he doesn't play in that top six, he wasn't going to flourish in a checking role. Naslin's second season wasn't much better, as he was reduced to only 14 games as he struggled with an injury. When he was healthy, he saw time in the minors as well as the press box as a healthy scratch. Naslin, who was heading into his third and final year of his entry-level contract, was labeled a bust and his future in hockey looked pretty bleak, but despite his unemotional demeanor on the outside, he was a determined individual on the inside. Naslin began the year with an impressive training camp, earning him the opportunity to play on a line with Mario Lemieux and Thomas Sandstrom, and as a result, Naslin was able to finally showcase his potential, scoring 19 goals and 33 assists in 66 games heading into the trade deadline. The fact that Naslin had requested a trade earlier in the year and it was the belief that the spike in his production was probably due to his line mates. Naslin was shipped out of Pittsburgh in what would turn out to be one of the most lopsided trades in NHL history. The Penguins had no shortage of skilled offensive players and they sought to add a power forward with grit. So they agreed to do a one for one deal, Naslin for Alex Stoyanov. Stoyanov had also struggled in Vancouver but the fact he bested Eric Lindros in a fight and with the perception that power forwards typically take longer to develop, the Penguins felt comfortable with the trade. Stoyanov would go on to play 54 games for the Pens, and Nasland? He would go on to play for another 13 seasons, as he would bloom into one of the world's most prolific scorers. Nasland's start with the Vancouver Canucks was an exciting time. Playing with the likes of the Russian dynamic duo Pavel Bure and Alex Mogilny, as well as team greats in Trevor Linden, Cliff Ronning, and Yerky Lume, it seemed like a good fit in which Naslin would finally be able to play a significant role within the team. 
but after going pointless in his first nine games since the trade, maybe he was a bust after all. In his 10th game, which turned out to be the season finale, the Canucks had to win to make the playoffs, and Naslin would break out with a hat-trick to send the team into the postseason, and even though they would get bounced in the first round, Naslin had shown glimpses that he could lead the team when it mattered most. The arrival of head coach Mike Keenan in the summer of 1997 was the beginning of a nightmare for Nasland. Keenan's my way or the highway style of coaching had turned the team upside down. Nasland's ice time started to dwindle as he would later even become a healthy scratch. The feeling started to resemble the one in Pittsburgh just a few years back and Nasland would ask for a trade. The newly acquired GM Brian Burke believed in him and convinced him to stay. Finally, someone who believed in him, and Naslin would go on to register a team-leading career-high 36 goals and 30 assists in the very next season in 98-99. It was during this season in which a struggling Mike Keenan was replaced by Mark Crawford as head coach, and his fast, run-and-gun style of play would really bring the best out of Naslin. It is now the year 2000, and Naslin had become the 11th captain and the first European captain in Vancouver Canucks history. Gone were the big names of yesteryear, players like Burray, Mogilny, and Messier. Naslin had the duty of leading the rebuild into the new millennium. He struck a close friendship with linemates Todd Bertuzzi and Brendan Morrison, as they would complement each other's skills perfectly. Bertuzzi's combination of physicality and finesse, Morrison's vision and playmaking, and Naslin's shot and stick handling. The future was here. They were the West Coast Express, and Naslin had finally reached his prime. He was deceptively quick. The way he did that jump to accelerate down the ice was enough to make 14-year-old me instantly captivated. He was patient, as even in the most critical of situations, he would still have the capacity to make that extra move to score that goal. His deking drove goalies insane. He could go forehand, backhand, or forehand, backhand, and forehand again. There was no book on him, but perhaps most importantly, he had a venomous wrist shot. He loved that wrist shot so much due to the fact that it offers up more options. He can still stick handle, or he can pass at the last possible moment, something he wouldn't be able to do with a slap shot. Naslin has such a calm demeanor, he was able to keep a young Canucks team grounded. Just look at his goal celebration, the composure, the nonchalance, it's like he's done it a million times before. Naslin would go on to reach career highs in goals and points in 0203, finishing second in the league in both categories. He would go on to win the Lester Pearson Award as the league's best player as voted by the players, as he became the first Swede and first Canuck to ever have this honor bestowed upon him. Even the Russian rocket Pavel Bure had not won that as a Canuck. The playoffs that year would mark Naslin's best shot at winning the cup. The first round series against the Blues would go the distance, and Naslin would score in Game 7 to help the team advance. In round two, the Canucks would grab a 3-1 series stranglehold, but the Minnesota Wild would win three straight to take the series in seven. Many fans surmise that if the Canucks had been able to reach the conference finals that year, they could have beaten a mighty Ducks team who were riding a hot goalie, and once they got to the finals, anything could have happened. The following 03-04 season would see the fall of the West Coast Express. Naslin would begin the season strongly, but it would unravel and unravel quickly. Heading into that game against the Colorado Avalanche on February 16, 2004, Naslin was the league's leading scorer at the time. But after overstretching for a puck and receiving a vicious elbow from Steve Moore, Naslin would leave the game with a concussion and a hyperextended elbow, and it was suspected he was never the same player upon his return. More tragically, there was a feeling in the air that this unpenalized event would ultimately lead the players to exact their own vengeance. March 8, 2004, when the Canucks played the Avs again, Bertuzzi would seek out Steve Moore in that infamous sucker punch that I'm not going to show so I won't get demonetized, but it was brutal, 
a career-ending moment for Moore that eventually had to be settled in court. And regrettably, Bertuzzi would be suspended indefinitely by the league and the West Coast Express would never be the same. It's unfortunate that the bond between Naslin and Bertuzzi, that very bond that allowed them so much success, was ultimately what led to their downfall. Naslin's production would see a steady decline year after year, and aside from reaching round two of the playoffs in 2007, he was instrumental in mentoring fellow Swedes from Arnjavik, the Sedin twins, as they would go on to succeed Naslin as leaders of the team. Naslin's 07-08 season proved to be his last with the Canucks, as he ended his tenure with the team as the franchise's leading goal scorer and point leader at the time. Naslin would go on to play for the New York Rangers for a season after signing with them during free agency, and he would retire from the NHL in 2009. The Canucks would go on to retire Naslin's number in 2010, signaling a highly successful career. Naslin would team up with Peter Forsberg during the 2009-2010 season as they played without salary for the struggling Moto team who was financially in trouble and fighting to avoid regulation. Upon the completion of the successful season, Naslin would announce his retirement for a second time, this time for good. He would go on to serve as Moto's general manager until 2014, after which he ventured into the business sector as a real estate developer as well as an investor for a ski resort. His ultimate goal is to help modernize the small town of Ornjavik. Marcus Naslin has had a respectable career. He will be remembered for a short time as one of the league's most dangerous players, but it was a shame the dominance had to be cut short. Though during Naslin's prime, few players could match his creativity, deking, and wrist shot. Naslin was not afraid to speak his mind. Whether it's bringing the NHL to court early in his career in order to be released from his agreement in Sweden so he could play in the NHL, or requesting a trade on several occasions because he was being treated poorly. He had a high moral compass, and that's one of the reasons he was able to garner the respect of teammates and opponents and it is with this in which we should learn from Marcus Nasland. Sometimes we find ourselves in toxic situations that we have no control over, and it's so easy to just roll with it. But like Naslin, don't be afraid to advocate for yourself and never settle for less than what you deserve. Marcus Naslin was truly a remarkable player who got the recognition in Vancouver, but not really anywhere else. He never won any championships nor many individual awards outside of Vancouver, and it's certainly a long shot for him to be inducted into the Hockey Hall of Fame. But for a young Canucks fan who got into hockey during his prime, he was my idol, my hero, captain my captain, Marcus Nasland. Thanks for watching. Bye.